All right, then, let's get into it. So this is uh, already part two of what might turn into a short series about my take on the super chops material. Um, so in the previous video, I mentioned um, that a lot of my information has come from discussing or reading conversations, I should say, um, generally hosted by Lee Adams. And um, the reason is that, that, that Lee um, studied with Jerome Callet in the 1980s. And, um, and essentially what, you know, his knowledge is, is almost entirely around the super chops system. Um, and even though I'm pretty sure that he was teaching the anchored TCE type tongue position late, um, later on, um, I do know that when Jerome Callet brought out the, the, um, uh, tr Trumpet Secrets book in 2002. Um, I'm, I'm hesitating now. It might have been 2001. Again, like I said before, I used to be, be encyclopedic about this stuff and it's, it's, I talk about it a lot less these days. And so it's, it's not, it's not there. But um, anyway, when, when Jerome Callip brought out the Trumpet Secrets book, um, Lee agreed with, with Jerry that um, he would sort of carry on promoting the older Super Chops material because he believed, he really does believe that this is, um, you know, one of the most effective ways to, to improve the playing of people who play play well already. Now, this is, um, this is a really important thing because that definition includes me. Um, I've, I said before that these videos aren't really about me. But it's worth understanding as a viewer that I was already a professional trumpet player when I came to this stuff. I have a degree um, in um, classical trumpet performance that I earned um, in 2005 or it's from the year two. I went to a specialist music school from 1998 until 2000. And then from 2001 to 2005, I studied with Philippe Schartz at the uh, Royal Welsh College of Music and Drama. And I did very well when I was there. I was, um, I was often uh, picked for first trumpet in um, the symphony orchestra, the chamber orchestra, the wind band, the modern music ensemble. There was a big band for a brief period of time and I played in that. I wasn't lead trumpet in that because there was another trumpet player who was very good at that sort of playing who was there studying at the same time. I had my own brass quintet and we toured the country doing that stuff and playing in some competitions and representing the college and all this sort of thing. So um, when I went, when I left college, I then I started teaching and I was playing as a soloist with, with local orchestras and I did some lectures at the um, uh, University of the West of England uh, Centre for, Center for Performing Arts and I played with their orchestra as well and um, so you know without giving you my entire CV um, that's just the, the that's the classical that's the classical side of it up to that point in time up to previous to me um, getting into TCE and stuff the point is that um, I, I was not a, what you would refer to as a struggling trumpet player. I've always had a, a good upper register. I just did it very badly. I, you know, I used to stretch my top lip and pin it in place with a large mouthpiece. And um, I am pretty confident that for about 15 years, my method of pitch manipulation was almost entirely mouthpiece pressure. Um, <laughs> which is ridiculous. I used to, you know, I used to overblow. In fact, I never, I didn't really blow much or properly at all when I was young. And when I started having lessons from better teachers, this is what they were obsessed with was, was me using more air. And that's one of the one of the reasons I'm really against that is because the, the the more air approach didn't really improve my playing in the ways that they you know they would expect, and the reason for that is that they, they weren't teaching me how to um, improve my embouchure. Um, they they would, in fact you know nobody that I worked with and I you know had a lot of master classes with with great musicians from around the world, 
um, as well as my regular lessons. And um, nobody ever said to me, oh, you know, this is what you're doing with your lips. Don't you think it might be wrong? Um, it was it was never about that. It was it was always about learning music. It was always about. Um, I mean, my my lessons with Philippe were were very um, broad in terms of the knowledge that he gave me and the attitude towards practice, the attitude towards um, you know this lifelong learning and, can't, and never you know don't leave any stone unturned and um, you know just self diagnosis of your of your issues but not so much about embouchure because that's not his speciality. You know, he's a, a principal trumpet and an international soloist. And um, that's, you know, if you don't, if you haven't had these issues, then you, you won't have spent time learning to solve them. So anyway, um, all of that said, I'm coming towards this material with, um, from the perspective of somebody who um just needed a you know better set of chops basically i was starting to play different types of music that was more physically demanding than than the orchestral and the the classical solo stuff that i had done up to that point and um and yeah i knew that i had limitations you know i had been able to play up to the the g above high c so if you have a, a treble stave treble staff you know g's at the top there's another G an octave higher than that. I could play that note from the age of 18, but I never played a semitone above it. Uh, not, um, you know, even after going through a lot of material, including the double high C and 37 weeks stuff, I couldn't play up there because I, it was just pressure and air and the wrong equipment, the wrong sound concept. Um, and so although I could play the notes, I, could, I wasn't really playing with control in that octave above the stave. I think that, that that's the thing that's, that's the sort of fundamental thing that's lost a lot of the time when people talk about playing in the upper register. And maybe if you look at the way that Maynard Ferguson discusses, um, discusses his development of his upper register, he talks about playing melodies. He talks about playing musically in the high register. And he's absolutely right that, you know, we need to be developing control and finesse up there. It's not. It's not just about blasting the blasting the sounds out. Um, and this does, believe it or not, lead us into some of the the material in the book. So let's um, let's just grab grab the book. My one of the copies of the book that I have here. Mark the pages really badly. So. Um, one of the things that Lee says quite a lot on the um, on, in discussions that I've had with him is that this page, page five of the original Super Chomps book, is um, he he what he has done in the past is give this page to um, to trumpet players, and he he claims that within a matter of months, getting them to focus on these pictures at the bottom has resulted in them vastly improving their trumpet playing. Now, I think that this is absolutely true. I believe it. Um, you know, it's I, my curious mind really makes me wonder whether if I had not discovered TCE, but in fact discovered the Super Chops book, this whole thing would have led me in a completely different direction. Um, but I've also spent a fair amount of time trying to do this stuff. Um, which is why, which is probably why it's, it's, it's been a little more successful than for me than those who have simply used only the material that exists publicly for free on the internet about the tongue controlled embouchure, which isn't very much. <laughs> so, um, what this page is showing us is three types of, um, of embouchure. Now, Again, it's it's a little bit obscured, and maybe maybe um, Jerome Callet was trying to avoid getting sued. But if you if you look at the top here, this what he refers to as the stretch or smile lips. This is how I used to play the trumpet. So I talked before about how 
I, I don't think I can, I really don't have that, the control to do that anymore. But um, I have um, loads of photographs of me playing the trumpet from when I was younger. And they're all like that. It's all this flat chin, tight corners. And the point is that as you ascend in pitch, your lips get thinner. And for me, that means weaker. And um, the sound gets thinner and weaker. And um, the pressure increases, holding the lips in place. Because a really fundamental part of this teaching that, that mattered a lot to me when I started out was um, that even though you're stretching the lips like this when you um when you play in that way and you blow too hard the lip collapses into the mouthpiece so i've got here a uh, vincent bach one and a quarter c trumpet mouthpiece and i think that most of that space is taken up by the lip collapsing forwards into the mouthpiece now i'm not demonstrating this well at all and i'm not making a i want to make this argument obvious and clear um when you uh tighten the corners of the mouth the lips open in the center you get you start to get a pucker it's not exactly like the the pucker in the picture there well, that really, really feels uncomfortable. Um, but th this actually is much more, uh, a little bit more like the Roy Stevens stuff. And I, that's a whole video in itself that I wanted to discuss how, how in many ways this Super Chops embouchure is the exact opposite of, of the Roy Stevens embouchure and why it's important to know that. Um, this is one of the things that ties all the, ties all the string, uh, all, the, all the tangled strings of various um, trumpet embouchure techniques is this this fund of this teaching and how this Roy Stevens stuff contradicts the super chop stuff and it's all very important but so when you tighten the corners you open the lips in the center and then many people will, will tell you that this is exactly what you want why do you want that well you want it because then you can get the air through great now we can get the air through it's never you're never going to get to that position where you've, you're what people would call um squeezing the lips or um i can't think of the word um but it doesn't matter um you know so you're not preventing the air from from getting into the trumpet by by uh, mashing the lips together. Now, that is a topic we'll have to circle back to, but um, that's why people want this. Now, what Jerry Callet argues in this book, and I am do I'm in complete agreement with this, is that um, yeah. So, what happens when your lips, when they are stretched, is that they break um, they break apart in the center of the mouthpiece. Once the lips break apart, excess mouthpiece pressure must be used to try to keep vibration in the lips. So that's because it's like the, do the donut between two pieces of glass effect. If you have a ring donut between two pieces of glass and you push, the, the, the hole in the center gets smaller. And that's what's happening when you're, when you're pushing your lips with a mouthpiece. Is that you know your one hard surface is your teeth, the other hard surface is the rim of the mouthpiece, and you're as you mash the lips together, yes, the aperture gets smaller, but it also, it's there. Anyway, sorry, uh, the lips are collapsing into the mouthpiece. That's what I mentioned. And then we use the, the mouthpiece pressure to put them back where they where they should be rather than using your, your muscles. Um, remember that without the lips touching, there will be no friction and no sound, only air going into the mouthpiece cup. Your tone gets thin, endurance is limited, and your lips become sore. This is how I used to play the trumpet. It's um, I played like that for a long time, and I was I won a lot. I won a lot of awards. <laughs> Yay! Congratulations. Um, so that's that's our standard traditional tight corners, flat chin embouchure. That's what I was. Um, that's what is, is sort of accepted as the the normal way to play um, to play the trumpet. Now, this next one here 
is um, pucker lips. Let's not, again, let's not beat around the bush. That's Maggio. That's the Maggio monkey. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's taking a step in the right direction because we're not, we're not tightening the corners anymore, but we're still flattening the chin. We've still got that flat chin. Um, now, the, the people who advocate for this system will tell you that uh, similarly to the other one, when you do this pucker, you're allowing the air through the lips. Um, and the problem with that is that, again, just like with the, with the smile or stretch lips, is that there's no resistance to the airstream. Now, I don't think I went into much detail about the resistance to the airstream yet, but that is one of our fundamental principles that I'll circle back to, and it's all in this, it's all in this book. Um, so the f yes this this Mag magio method um the the long and short of it is that if you are not creating the resistance here then you have to create it somewhere else now where that that other place is going to be um with the tongue because that's they, they talk about tongue level the rea whether it's the magio system which talks about it being at the back of the mouth which is horrendous you're just creating you know preventing the air from getting through um, or whether it's the, the Claude Gordon system with the anchored tip behind, or, you know, the, the, the tip, um, I don't want to say this incorrectly, but just say anchored tongue because it's, it's the accepted terminology. The tip is anchored behind the bottom teeth and then the tongue arches up and forward as we ascend in pitch. Now, yes, that's going to create a little bit more resistance to the airstream, not in the way that we want for TCE um or indeed for super chomps but it's it's essentially that this is what this is the how they think is that you can use more air power and you know and and your then there's all sorts of silly explanations that don't make sense like the tongue being like an airplane wing or the the air flowing over the tongue and it gets accelerated as it reaches the aperture that's all you know from the point of view of somebody who has a basic understanding of physics we know that that's not true but it's what is taught and it's one of those things that for many people it doesn't matter whether it's true or not what what matters is that they're teaching a thing that um that is effective for them and you know they believe that is the only way to play but um you know you can't deny that there are a lot of people out there who play in this way and think in this way my personal experience is that I came out of college well versed in the Claude Gordon theory and when I tried to teach it to children they could not do it. They could not figure out how, how to use the tongue to manipulate pitch um, and I started to sort of notice that when you're saying to people R and E that really you know though because of the way we talk because of the way we use the mouth, the only people for whom it was effective is is those who, when they say ah, they open the jaw, and when they say e, they close the jaw and stretch the lips to the side. And that's not what we're doing here. That's not that's not what the tongue level thing is. That's not what Mangio was. It's not what the stretch and smile embouchure is about. It's all just nonsense. So. Um, I'm not criticizing the idea. What I'm criticizing is the way that it's described and the reason that people think it works. I don't think it's the most ef the, the most effective way to understand the physics of brass playing. Um, and that's why I'm more an advocate of, the, of this other material. You know, that's, um, that's just the way it is. So, um, conscious of the time again. All I'm going to do is tie tie this up by mentioning the the bot the picture at the bottom, which is um, that of super chops. And then in the next video, I want to start off by discussing the you know different ways of describing what's going on here, and why it's important to think about it. Um, what what is effectively happening or or not happening? is that the, the, there's no firmness at the corners like this. The chin is now pushing up and not stretching down. And um, 
we are we are creating what may be referred to as central lip compression. Now, I don't. I, I was um, reluctant to say those words at the end of this video, but that's essentially what um, that's essentially what we're going after. And the reason I I wanted to avoid it a little is because um, I don't believe that it's simply pushing the lips together, though it's very easy to mis misinterpret the, the, the written material in that way. And, um, you know, I've read online that, you know, Jerry even said to people at one point that he wanted to stop teaching this material because they were focusing too much on um, certain things that he'd said. And I'll, I'll leave it at that because I don't want to start a whole new topic now. But um, thanks for watching, and I will continue this, this talk um, on the Super Chops material in the next video. Um, yes, let's leave it there. Bye for now.